good afternoon to all of you now when we speak of a topic belonging to a region region called south canara 1799 to 1860 early half of the 19th century 1800 to 1860 early half of the 19th century we as students or researchers of history have to take into consideration what happened in the british indian context in that particular century in other words it is always important to see what kind of writings are available to us on 19th century india or on british india or colonial india when we look at the historiography of modern indian history or historiography of british india there are at least five major schools of writings one the imperialist or colonial writing two the nationalist writing three the marxist writing four the cambridge writings or writings of scholars belonging to the cambridge school and fifth the subaltern school so historians belonging to these five schools most important schools with regard to historiography of modern india they give us much insight or perspective into what we are going to study about a region and in this case it happens to be south canara it is very important to know the historiographical writings at the national level because it gives us it provides us a larger perspective it helps us to ask questions to the sources that we have before us by asking inquisitive questions or interesting questions to the historical facts that we have or sources that we have we can get good results and meaningful interpretation of regional history in other words what i am trying to say is that regional history has to be placed in the larger context of the national history after making reference to these schools and the abundant historical works that are available to us on indian national movement or on british india in the indian historiography there are many debates one important debate relates to 18th century india as we know 18th century india was very important because 1707 saw the death of aurangzeb and after that there was a slowly the entry of the english and 1757 marked the great day battle of plassey after which the company's rule began in india 1707 saw the disintegration beginning of the disintegration of the mughal empire 1757 saw the establishment of the company's rule in india so early half of the 18th century let us say roughly from 1707 to 1757 was always uh, you know discussed by historians and there is a debate relating to that period of indian history that is called dark age versus prosperity some historians call that period as the dark age some historians call that as the period of prosperity the second half of the 18th century that is to say from 1757 to 1900 sorry 1800 1757 to 1800 the later half of the 18th century also is known for a debate and that debate is around the issue of continuity versus change so 1757 when the companies government came into being they started introducing many changes that continued subsequently in the second half of the 18th century 
so 1757 to 1800 whether there were changes or whether they were continuities so continuity versus change many historians they argue that there were wholesale changes a great overhaul existed and one important name that i could give as a tall historian who discussed this issue of change is uh, irfan habib irfan habib educates the thesis that there were many changes whereas there are also many historians particularly who are called as revisionists or maybe some of them belonging to the cambridge school arguing that there were many changes not continuities but changes sorry not changes but continuities so about change irfan habib argued about continuity i am giving only one name and it is that of chris bailey or christopher a bailey c a bailey a cambridge historian who argued that the company authorities simply stepped into the shoes of the mughals there were not many changes there were here and there certain changes but the same kind of administration continued so this debate is around this issue of change versus continuity why i am making a reference to this debate of the second half of the 18th century is that this is somewhere applicable to us also to 19th century south canara there it happened in the 18th century later half of the 18th century here it happened in the early half of the 19th century that is to say 1800 to 1850 or let us say 1800 to 1860 whether there were many changes whether there were continuities so when we ask this question it helps us to make certain concrete uh, investigation into the various changes that the company government had introduced in the region of south canara in this region also we see far reaching changes we also see a few continuities and what are these changes and what are these continuities we will see as we progress further in the course of this lecture maybe in another 40 to 50 minutes and when we come to the region of south canara before i took up this topic there were certain works already existing and in that i should make a reference to john starak and h h stewart 1894 and 1895 in these years they published madras district gazetteer south canara district volume 1 and volume 2 1894 1895 starak and stuart very useful volumes i could get some idea rough idea about the period which i was going to study apart from starak and stuart the south canara district gazetteer published by government of karnataka which was edited by k abhishankar it was published in the year 1973 it also had some reference to south canara then uh, one phd thesis i could see but not relating to my period of study in fact it studied from 1860 onwards to 1956 1860 1956 socio economic conditions in south canara by h karunakara i did not see any other work which related to this period of study then i had to go to the archives particularly tamil nadu state archives situated at egmur where i worked almost for one year not continuously whenever it was possible particularly during the summer vacation and uh, i could get most of the sources 
which I had used in my thesis in the Tamil Nadu State Archives. Some of the records I also got from Karnataka State Archives. Then, of course, locally I could not get uh, many sources. Though I tried to see uh, the collectorate office, etc., I could not get much of the records. But anyhow, it was because of the information that I got from Tamil Nadu State Archives, particularly most of the primary sources I could uh, collect from there. And fortunately for me that uh, archives, at least my period of study, was indexed properly. So I could uh, make use of the index and go to the right document to get the right information for my thesis. Then there were a few reports also that were available, like Levin's report, Cotton's report, Cabin's report. They were related to the peasant uprising of 1830-31. Then of course here and there some secondary works were there. Subsequent to my work, many others have written. I am not going into the detail of that. They are all available in the world of scholarship. Now one good thing is that any PhD thesis is available in Shodh Ganga. So if you go to Shodh Ganga site, we can get all PhD thesis which is awarded with the degree recently in the last few decades. Then at the larger level, B.H. Baden Powell, Land Systems of British India, three volumes. Very important work. Just I want to make a reference to that because it gives an idea of land revenue administration in British India. Then, of course, yes, Sundaraj Ayangar, land tenures in the Madras Presidency. Like that, we can go on increasing the number. But why I made a reference to this is to say that when I took up the subject for research, it was almost like a virgin area, not much researched. But today, we do have some other works, some other researchers who have contributed much more to the understanding of this period of study. Now, after these introductory remarks, I come directly to Land Revenue Administration in South Canada. So, when I say South Canada here, one or two information about the geography of the region. The South Canada that I researched and the South Canada that I am going to talk today extended from Koteshwara in the north to Kawai River in the south. Koteshwara in the north to Kawai River, little bit of south from Nileshwar in the south. Of course, the eastern and western boundaries, they remain the same. Whatever existed earlier, today also they are the same. The Amarasulya region from 1804 to 1834 was not part of South Canada because it was given to the Gurg Raja as a reward because he had helped the British in fighting against Tipu Sultan. So, 1834 once again it came back to South Canada. Then the Amindivi group of islands, five groups of islands, five islands known as the Amindivi group of islands were part of South Canada at that point of time. 1799-1800 there were four taluks, by 1860 they became six taluks. In other words, as time passed by, they made certain changes in the divisions with regard to administration. The collectorate establishment was in Mangalore, sub-collector was also here, and the entire province was known as the province of Kenara and Sunda, Sunda or Sunda they used to write. Double O also they used to write. Entire province of Canara and Sunda. But uh, my interest was only in the South Canara region. So by South Canara what I mean is this region that I have explained to you just now. And uh, it was only in 1860 that the province was divided. They divided actually in 1800. Northern, Northern Division and Southern Division. But soon they reunited that. Then again in 1860 they divided. In 1862 the northern region was transferred to Bombay Presidency. That time Kundapur Taluk 
they added with South Canara. That was in 1862. So as I studied in that region, Kundapura did not exist, but Kote Shura was the last place in the northern part of the southern division of Canara. This is with regard to the geographical extent of the region. Now, why land revenue administration was important? Because the company government, even later on the British government, after 1857, they knew very well that land revenue was the most important source of revenue. That was the area from where they could collect maximum revenue for the government. And one general feature, characteristic feature of British colonial system or administration in India was that they wanted to collect the maximum revenue from India. And most of that revenue came from land revenue. And along with the land revenue, there were many other sources of revenue. In fact, uh, I could get a list of revenue items or revenue heads wherein up to 50, more than 50 revenue heads are there or were there. So there was village tax, there was uh, sea customs, there was uh, land customs, there were several heads of revenue, but uh, land revenue was the major one. So therefore, they had to concentrate on land revenue administration. And when the region was annexed, 1799-1800, when Tipu fell, when Srirangapatnam fell in the fourth Anglo-Mysore War, 1799-1800, was the beginning of the company's rule in this part of India. The nature of landholding became very important. In fact, about the nature of landholding, Sir Thomas Munro, who was the first collector of this region, wrote uh, several letters, several correspondence between him and the Board of Revenue at Madras. Sir Thomas Munro was much pleased to see and also surprised to see the system of private property that existed in the region of South Canada. Again and again, in most of his letters, he makes a reference to private property system in the region, which manifested in the form of Moola Varg or Mooli Varg in the region of South Canada. So on the issue of Moola Varg or the right that the Moola Vargadars had, Thomas Munro wrote extensively reporting the condition here to the Madras Board of Revenue. There was another important reason why he wrote also. Because the company authorities wanted Munro to introduce the Cornwallis system of land revenue administration here, not the Raithwari system which he introduced here. Because in Bengal, the Zamindari system or permanent settlement of land revenue administration was introduced. They wanted to extend that to Madras Presidency also. But in Madras Presidency in the other regions like Baramahal, Sidhe districts, etc., Raithwari system was already existing. Most parts of Madras Presidency was under the Raithwari system. Here Munro wanted Raithwari system because Munro argued that a private proprietary right on land existed deep rooted in South Canada. Munro argued. And in fact, I was surprised to see that in all his correspondence, when he was here, when he was not here also, whatever he wrote, he always made reference to Mulivarg in South Canada. And we, as we know, Mulivarg meant private proprietary right over the soil, over the land. And Mulavargadar had a patta with him, his original document identifying him as the owner of the land. In other words, the title deed stood in his name. It was a hereditary in nature. It could be transferred to his son, son to son, like that. 
it was hereditary it was a transferable it was a transferable property everything he writes in so many words about mulavark and also he was surprised because he said this uh, private property system in south canara was more deep rooted and more perfect than that of the private property system that existed in england munro himself wrote in several letters it was more deep rooted and more perfect than that of the private property system in england munro said it was more ancient also he said he takes in his uh, correspondence the antiquity of this uh, original proprietary right to the 14th century but he doesn't say when exactly it began at least he says it must have existed from the 14th century onwards and uh, when uh, moliver right existed on land we called that proprietor or that landlord as the moliver gadar so one who held muli right over the land became moliver gadar which was hereditary land and it was also transferable property apart from private property system there also existed land owned by the government here not that all land belonged to the private individuals and these private individuals were called as muli vargadars or they were called as landlords and munro also understood them to be the riots and uh, derived from that the rayatwari system so when we say rayat generally what we mean is that rayat is the one who cultivates the land we will come to that issue later so it is rayatwari system that was introduced here made sense only on paper not in reality because many of the rayats they were in fact big landlords they were zamindars who did not cultivate the land by themselves we will go to that detail a little later when once the private property system existed and people had a different sizes of land these muli vargadars if the size of the land was too big too vast naturally they could not cultivate the land by themselves and uh, the system of giving land through various tenancies existed earlier also and munro continued with that system so that is why different tenurial systems or practices came into being during the company period also and we have reference to moolageni chalageni and vaidageni one who held the land in moolageni was moolageni dar chalageni chalageni dar vaidageni vaidageni dar though these three systems of land tenures existed or leasing out land to the tenants for cultivation purpose existed mostly moolageni and chalageni were preferred vaidageni was the least preferred moolageni was almost permanent as long as the tenant paid the share of the landlord or the muli vargadar he could enjoy the benefits of his cultivation on that piece of land only if he did not pay the share to the landlord then the landlord could take action on him as long as he paid the share of the landlord he had almost hereditary right on the land which he got under this scheme of moolageni it was almost hereditary in nature and it was the most preferred form of a tenancy that existed in this region it was the most secure as far as the geni there was con- concerned as far as the tenant was concerned chalageni was for a fixed period of time as long as he paid the rent to the zamindar or to the muli vargadar 
he could enjoy that but uh, it was not as perennial or as uh, permanent as that of the mulagani whatever uh, developments that these ganidars did whether it was under mulagani or chalagani whenever the land was uh, finally given back to the mulavargadar they were given some compensation we do have references to that if they did some improvements at the time of giving back the land maybe after 5 years 10 years 20 years they would be given some compensation for the work which they have done but it was not as secure as that of mulagani chalagani was not that secure and in mulagani always the gani was uh, right in the beginning fixed at a higher rate in other words a very high amount was fixed because they knew that every year they were not going to renew it even chalagani every year they never renewed then there were also small minor systems of tenancy like kayam gani nigadi gani even the meanings of these are given smaller systems in other words they were not that much vogue in relation to the first two systems that is mulagani and chalagani why the gani as the name itself tells it is for a definite period of time maybe 2 years maybe 4 years maybe 5 years so because the many of the landlords held large areas of land they had to take shelter under these different tenancies whether it is mulagani or chalagani or vaidagani now we come to the kind of revenue system that sir thomas munro had introduced sir thomas munro as i told you introduced the rayatwari system of land revenue administration here when we look at all india we speak of the zamindari system we speak of the mahalwari system and thirdly we speak of the rayatwari system munro said because a private property existed here because it was a deep rooted in the region because it was hereditary in nature because uh, the inhabitants were almost you know inseparably attached to the system of private property we cannot introduce zamindari system here we have to introduce rayatwari system only munro argued though the board of revenue wanted to introduce zamindari system munro gave his report but finally munro introduced rayatwari system why did he introduce rayatwari system one important reason was that private property existed here second perhaps we can identify as a reason because when once the existing system was accepted it was easy to win over the people the confidence of the people the goodwill of the people if the private properties are taken over by the people people will be definitely they will be unhappy there would be unrest there would be resentment people would not cooperate so a kind of diplomacy or a kind of administrative shrewdness munro said it is better to accept the existing system rather than imposing a new system like the cornwallis zamindari system also one more reason was there in this region though there were many zamindars they were not comparable to the zamindars of bengal they were called as the lodial gentry very big zamindars in bengal here the many some zami, some landlords were really zamindars we will come to that point later scholars like k k n kurup from calicut university who also happened to be my teacher in mangalore university neil charlesworth eric stokes and other scholars who have written on revenue system in modern india they said that munro understanding of the rayatwari or the word rayat is debatable they said whether all the rayats of south kendra were really rayats the answer is no because they were not cultivating the land by themselves many of them were leasing out the land for cultivation to the tenants maybe a small portion of the land they managed by themselves but uh, many other areas were with the tenants but uh, munro made an arrangement 
for land revenue settlement with these rights whether they were big or whether they were of middle class or whether they were of lower class i mean the depending upon the size of the land held by them so absence of big zamindars as in the case of bengal was another important re reason why rightwari system was introduced also without annihilating the rights of private property he could introduce the rightwari system therefore because of all these reasons he introduced the rightwari system and opposed the zamindari system in this region to the board of revenue in madras munro wrote saying that if we club these areas together reorganize them into large estates instead of small lands we would be we would be pushing back this region by a century or two and from that state it will have to compulsorily compulsorily return back to the present state of small proprietors munro argued we may try to create a large estates but it will not survive it will not succeed once again small estates will come into being munro argued munro's belief was that the name of the landlord belonged to the rayat or the cultivator he could see here rayats or cultivators he identified them with the landlord or landlord was identified with the rayat so it was not actually correct because many landlords were big landlords they were not in reality cultivating their land by themselves so the rayatwari system both in theory and practice did not make meaning only in theory it made meaning in practice it did not make sense because many of the rice were zamindars and they had to depend upon tenants for cultivation of their land so what was the system rayatwari system was one in which the land revenue settlement was made with the land owners whom munro called as rayats land owners or landlords became rayats for him who paid the land revenue directly to the government it was good in the sense that this system did not create middlemen there were no intermediaries between the rayats on the one side and the government on the other in the zamindari system that came into being there was chain of intermediaries R.C. Dutt says, who wrote Economic History of India, one of the most important early Indian nationalists, from the peasants to the government, there were at least 50 to 60 intermediaries in this involved in the system of revenue administration. R.C. Dutt noted, but here the intermediaries had no role to play. That way, the system has to be commended. So the big landlords or big mulavargadars. obviously leased out certain portions of their land to the tenants through the systems of tenancy that existed here where it was mulagani or chalagani or vaidagani whatever they preferred whatever was possible at that point of time and uh, these tenants they paid rent to the mulavargadar or to the zamindar or to the landlord and he in turn paid the revenue to the state whatever revenue he was supposed to pay one or two quotations i would just tell you as to what they felt those scholars like rc dat had analyzed munro's rayatwari system as a settlement with the rayat or cultivating peasant in his capacity as proprietor in practice the ideal rayat of munro was nothing but a land monopolist or zamindar who possessed thousands of acres of land and remained an absentee landlord cornwallis system created absentee landlordism this particular observation is made by professor kurub with regard to the bekal taluk 
of South Canada. Bekal was part of South Canada during our period of study. And Professor Kurupe studied agrarian system, agrarian relations there. And he says after his study that there were many landlords who were zamindars and who almost were like absentee landlords. But the system that existed was Raitwari system. I just gave one quotation. In the same way, Neil Charlesworth says, in the strictest Raitwari system, it was sometimes difficult to recognize the appropriate level of cultivating right and any indigenous elites in practice were probably able to preserve extensive powers in many villages. Indigenous elites, here is a reference to the landlords, they were able to have great powers over the rest of the society around them because of the land that they had with them, because of the socio-economic status that they had with them. So he was the owner of the land. With him the government would enter into land revenue agreement. He had to pay the stipulated revenue to the company government. So after this uh, Raitwari system, now I will make a reference to land revenue assessment. How much was collected from the people? People I mean the landlords. On the one hand the landlords, on the other hand the tenants. Landlords directly paid land revenue to the state. Tenants paid it to the landlords. So a chala genidar, a mula genidar, a vaida genidar had to pay to his landlord rent. So when he paid the landlord's share, we call that as rent. And when the landlord paid his share to the government, it was called as revenue. So land revenue and land rent, two important words. And also in British India, whenever there was movement, civil disobedience movement or uh, non-cooperation movement, no rent, no revenue campaign. You will see the phrase like this, no rent, no revenue campaign. So what the tenant paid to the landlord is rent. So what landlord paid to the government, land revenue? So these two important aspects existed. How much was collected? On the whole, based on whatever I have seen, documents, and also comparing with the other parts of British India, it is uh, almost... Uh, a unanimous conclusion among scholars that uh, the British government always wanted to collect the maximum from land. Maximization of land revenue was the key feature. It was the most important feature of the British land revenue administration in India. This observation is made by many historians and I could see that in the case of South Canada also. Because uh, Munro had criticized the revenue system that existed during the period of the Mysore Sultans. As we know, Shivapanayaka's time, what is called as Shivapanayaka's shist became very popular. Kaladinayaka's, whatever they have imposed on the people here, in addition to that, Mysore rulers during the period of Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, what they added came to be called as Shamil. Shist and Shamil. So whatever Kaladi rulers had imposed on the people, plus whatever Mysore Sultans had increased during their period, this was the basis on which Munro or the British revenue system began. It's a system of revenue administration. Though Munro criticized that uh, the Mysore exactions, means collection of revenue, was much more than what the people of the region could pay, he did not deviate much from that. He did not depart much from that. Munro at least during the early period of administration, British administration here, at least one or two years, when he was collector here, the first collector argued that 
the people were not able to pay what the mysore sultans were collecting he wanted to give relief to them therefore in his uh, all correspondence he argued that maximum that the company government could collect was what people were paying during the kaladi period plus maximum half of what tipu sultan had added to that so the company government should not collect more than what they paid during the kaladi period plus half of 50% of what tipu had added to the revenue that was collected earlier maximum that they could go up to was 3/4 of tipu's additions 3/4 not more than that total what tipu collected should not be collected munro argued this was almost followed by the subsequent collectors also on paper many times they wrote repeatedly that they were collecting much more revenue then what the rice could actually pay in the region time and again they reported to the board of revenue but they never made sincere attempts to really reduce the share of the state in other words during these decades of the early 19th century we see that year after year land revenue collected from the region went on increasing slowly it went on increasing and at various points of time the collectors who came from england one after the other reported that they were collecting more than what really the rights of the region could pay and there was a need to change the system of revenue collection we see attempts made by them to change it also for example 1817 1818 they tried to introduce some changes by introducing what is called as the sarasari system average system of revenue collection means whatever they had collected for last 17 years average of that they would calculate and that amount would be collected from the rath or from the landlord but uh, british officers themselves pointed out that this was also a very slippery foundation slippery foundation or faulty foundation because uh, whatever was collected last 18 years also in many cases they were uh, too high and uh, naturally the average that you get also will be high in other words during their period though from time to time they made efforts to change the system collect a little bit less that the people could pay there was hardly any real effort to reduce the revenue burden of the people of the region and we have the details of the revenue collected by the company government in the region i could see almost for 60 years except one or two years here and there always the amount went on shooting up except uh, some years like 1810 11 or 1825 to 1830 31 here and there some years because of uh, other problems like uh, economic depression or uh, failure of crops problems like that economic problems uh, affected the amount of revenue collected by the state and uh, we could also see that uh, those years there were problems because uh, peasants also organized themselves 1810 11 there was peasant unrest 1830 31 again there was peasant uprising what they called as kuta dange they called as kut rebellion so we could see many problems and late 1820s was a period of depression in the whole of the madras presidency people like sharada raju and others they have written on that uh, problem of uh, economic depression which affected the region also so they never made a uh, sincere effort to reduce the burden half hearted attempts were made munro argued that at least 50% of the net produce on land should be collected by the state 
fifty percent of the net produce of the land. Sometimes they say fifty percent of the gross produce of the land. Sometimes reference is made to net produce. Sometimes reference is made to gross produce. So we don't exactly get what exactly was collected. In the same way, whatever company government had collected from private proprietors, same way company government also collected from government land. Almost fifty percent of the produce of the land by way of revenue went to the government. And one important change we have to note is during this period that company government collected revenue only in cash, not in cash and kind. During the pre-British system. revenue could be paid both in cash as well as kind but during the company period it could be paid only in cash and paying in cash created further problem for the rais because the rais did not have much money with them most of them they were middle class rais or small proprietors of land big rais of course could pay always they would have some savings with them middle class or lower middle class or small peasants i mean peasant proprietors did not have money with them so soon after the harvest they would go to the market to sell their crops naturally when the supply is more naturally the price comes down so they will have to sell large quantities of their produce in the market to get that money realize that hard cash and then pay the share of the state or pay the share of the zamindar so cash payment had uh, really created much problem to the middle class and uh, poor rais this was a big change that came about munro said that uh, tipus period saw very high revenue collection he did not depart much from that he argued that we should uh, give relaxation only to the extent that uh, we are able to collect the remaining amount of revenue in other words we should be able to collect the maximum if that is not possible give some relaxation to the peasants or to the rais that was the argument of munro why munro said this because munro noted that were numberless uh, land disputes were there in the region numberless land disputes why land dispute is there because people were after land why people would be after land only when they have profit in land they will be after land so when there are a large number of litigations in the court about land naturally about a boundary dispute or maybe ownership dispute or a dispute among the successors of a particular family whatever it is everybody fought for ownership of a piece of land means that there is demand for land there is a profit from land and as long as there is this kind of a run or demand for land we can collect the maximum from land revenue this was the understanding of munro munro also realized that the bidanur shist bidanur shist means the keladi shist keladi shist or bidanur shist their capital changed three times as you know of keladi rulers so itself probably was extremely unequal originally munro said the revenue system that prevailed during the keladi period influenced the system of the mysore period and he got whatever existed earlier and the revenue fixed during the earlier period must have been unequal munro understood and uh, many collectors after munro also said that uh, we were not uh, on sound foundations as far as the fixation of land revenue was concerned there was also another problem with regard to the measurement of land how a cultivated land was measured it was the ancient bijavari system that existed in the region decided the extent of the land so if you ask our parents or elderly people they will say idu ondu mudigadde idu eradu mudigadde adu nalku mudigadde 
means one mura of paddy is required to saw this particular piece of land that is the extent of this land idu ondu mudigadde adu eradu mudigadde so it was not scientifically measured what is the extent of this land how many acres this land is there so what munro said was actually this that we have inherited a kind of system of levying land revenue which was not that scientific not that rational and we continued on that and successors of munro also said the same thing that uh, we have not done scientific survey of land then we may ask the question why they did not do scientific survey of land by 1830s 1840s they realized that land had to be surveyed scientifically but they could not do it maybe either purposefully postponed or they did not want to invest that much on the manpower to survey the land extensively land uh, surveying was done only in the later half of the 19th century towards the end of the 19th century in this region until that time they followed the rough and ready system of uh, this bijavari assessment of land which was available to them they continued on the basis of that land and uh, because of that there was over assessment partly because of that and partly because they wanted to collect more over assessment on land they collected much more than what the rights could pay and anomaly also in the revenue collected by the state anomaly means uh, there is inequalities inequalities were there sometimes uh, a right who could pay more who was supposed to pay more was charged less somebody who was supposed to pay less was charged more because it came like that to them and they continued like that they really did not examine whether that right has more land or this right has less land you know normally in the revenue amount of revenue assessed on a particular field or different fields continued during the british times and uh, many times we come across a reference to this particular anomaly in the revenue records they said this has to be rectified but uh, we have not seen in the records or practically also that they were rectified partly because it was a colonial state they did not really take the welfare of the people into consideration finally they believed starting from the time of munro that no guide was as sure as collection what is the guide for us what is the parameter to assess or impose revenue on the land that is uh, collection over the last several years if you have collected revenue from a piece of land then it means that that is okay if you have not collected it means that it is over assessment so no guide is as sure as collection they said that is why the idea of sarasari assessment and change in assessment all this came into being after munro other collectors they also argued for example alex alexander reed argued that we are collecting more almost 50% it has to be brought down to 30% of the gross produce alexander reed wrote to the board of revenue but it did not happen like this uh, many times in the records we could see that uh, the realities of the time were recorded not that always uh, they hided the facts but uh, we have to understand all these in the broader context of colonialism to really understand what was working in their mind many times they thought they wrote but in reality whether they had really the intention to reduce was the question we do not find uh, much reference to the qualitative division of the land we could get a reference to land of first sort second sort third sort three sorts of land maybe people belonging to south kendra we can think of these lands as uh, one crop land or two crop land or three crop land uh, bayalu 
ಮಜಲು ಆರ್ ಬೆಟ್ಟು ಲೈಕ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಪರ್ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ಸ್ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಬಟ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕಲಿ ಲುಕಿಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಿಫೈಯಿಂಗ್ ದೆಮ್ ಡಿಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ದೇರ್ ಕ್ವಾಲಿಟಿ ಡಿಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟ್ ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪೀರಿಯಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೈಮ್ ನ್ಯಾಚುರಲಿ ದ ರೆವೆನ್ಯೂ ಅಸೆಸ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಬೌಂಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಫಾಲ್ಟಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದ ಬೀಜಾವರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಐ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ರಿಸಲ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಓವರ್ ಅಸೆಸ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆನ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಎಬ್ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಸರ್ವೆ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಸೊ ಎವ್ರಿ ಇಯರ್ ವಿ ಕುಡ್ ಸಿ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಆ್ಯನ್ಯುವಲ್ ಜಮಾಬಂದಿ ಜಮಾಬಂದಿ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ರೆವೆನ್ಯೂ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ರೆವೆನ್ಯೂ ಸೆಟಲ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಜಮಾಬಂದಿ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಇಯರ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಇಯರ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ರೆವೆನ್ಯೂ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ದೇರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಎ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ಸ್ ವೆನ್ ಎ ರೈತ್ ವಾಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಪೇ ರೆವೆನ್ಯೂ ಟು ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಪಂಡ್ ದೇ ಗೇವ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇಯರ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಎ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ರುಪೀಸ್ ಒನ್ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ರುಪೀಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ವಾಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಪೇಯ್ಡ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಕೆಪ್ಟ್ ಎ ಸೈಡ್ ಎಸ್ ಎ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ದೆನ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ ವಾಸ್ ಕಲೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಇಯರ್ ಅವರ್ ಫಾಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ ವಾಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎವರ್ ರೆಮಿಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಪೇಯ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ರೈಸ್ ಸಬ್ಸಿಕ್ವೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಸಪೋಸ್ ಇಫ್ ದೇ ರಿಮೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆಟ್ ಟು ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫೈವ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ದೆನ್ ದೇರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ವುಡ್ ಬಿ ಕಾನ್ಫಿಸ್ಕೇಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ land would be confiscated and it would be publicly auctioned and another right or zamindar who is able to pay the stipulated share of the state would take over that land in other words failure to pay the revenue falling in arrears would either result in going to the village zamindar or landlord borrowing loan by mortgaging the land or uh, foregoing the ownership of the land if you fall in arrears to the government after 4 5 years definitely your land will be taken away by the state if that is to be prevented the right had to go to the zamindar or uh, merchant money lender he would charge it is said 6 to 12 percent interest they charged record say on the money or loan which they have given to the right to pay the share of the zamindar or share of the state whatever is the case how did they take loan they mortgaged their land or crop when they mortgaged their land it was called as living mortgage when they mortgaged the crop it was called as a dead mortgage first one was bogi adi adavu second one was toradu or toradu they called living mortgage and dead mortgage and uh, as in british india in south canara also when land was mortgaged mostly the rais were not able to repay that loan and finally land was confiscated by the person who lent the money who gave the loan the money lender or the merchant money lender or a powerful landlord rich landlord he will also get control of that land and also another important uh, issue is there when the government gave remission the benefit of the remission came to the landlord it came to the mula vargadar it did not go to the tenant because the mula vargadar was one who had agreement with the state so when the state gave remission it was to the mula vargadar it was not to the ganidar ganidar did not benefit because of the remission so you see a kind of situation in which uh, over assessment existed many of the rais were not able to pay the share of the state or share of the landlords they fell in arrears and this led to rural indebtedness rural indebtedness generally it created a situation of poverty impoverishment of the peasants impoverishment of land because when they did not have money to pay the revenue how would they how would how would they invest on the land even they would not use any fertilizer on the land 
so land itself will be impoverished first of all they are impoverished then land is impoverished so on the whole there was a decline in terms of uh, the quality of the land in terms of the economic condition of the region which uh, is comparable to any other region in british india in addition to that there were other issues like uh, for example tobacco monopoly was introduced people were cultivating tobacco not to a large extent it was introduced in uh, 1803 and withdrawn in 1854 to cultivate a tobacco they had to take license and then they had to sell the tobacco to the government storehouse only so it was a kind of monopoly of the state same way salt monopoly we know the history of the salt how gandhi ji took up the case of salt because gandhi ji said salt is something which is required by the rich by the poor by the healthy by the unhealthy for everybody salt is needed and which is almost freely available in the sea shore if government could tax on that then what else this government cannot tax gandhi ji asked so salt monopoly in the region was introduced in 1806 and it continued and the salt satyagraha was a very major component of our freedom struggle in this region also more than this region in uttar kannada region particularly ankola here also people went to bandar to manufacture salt during the salt satyagraha so that was there then uh, many other kinds of taxes even a barber had to pay tax a craftsman had to pay salt uh, tax there were various kinds of village taxes so all these created burden for the people but uh, when this uh, tenancy system existed there was also a uh, humanitarian aspect in that that is the relationship between the zamindar and the tenants the british collectors noted that there was a great fidelity between the zamindar and the tenant there was some kind of confidence and zamindars may not be all some at least they were considerate towards their tenants and uh, whatever uh, happened between them they never shared with the state so a ray of hope at least for some patients existed though there was a generally uh, you know a kind of uh, difficult situation that existed uh, during the colonial period by way of over assessment of land and also by way of anomaly in terms of revenue assessment in other words the same kind of land was assessed differently during the colonial period during this period if a land is there if 1000 rupees is collected b land same kind of land could be more than 1000 or less than 1000 also this what they meant by anomaly and another important uh, issue in the revenue administration was a difference between jamabandi price and market price jamabandi price means settlement price revenue settlement price market price is the price which peasant would get or rait would get when he sells paddy or arakanant whatever it is in the market when the jamabandi was fixed the colonial authorities would look at the market price so initially the jamabandi price was less than the market price so it was it makes sense jamabandi price should be less than the market price because the producer will go to the market he will get more money and in that uh, some money he has to pay to the state or to the landlord if the obverse happens if market price is less than the jamabandi price then the peasant had it this kind of situation 
took place or uh, it uh, came in in the 1830s 1830s onwards we come across in the revenue records references to this that jamabandi price was higher than the market price and uh, naturally the patients will have to sell large amounts of produce in the market to realize cash and then the money had to be paid to the landlord or to the company government as the case may be see for example here harris the collector says i am quoting the lands of canara were assessed at a jamabandi price for their produce yet 56 rupees a corge corge unit of measurement 56 rupees a corge the bazar price obtained was then rupees 100 means initially when they fixed 56 rupees per corge bazar price was 100 that and now for 3 years is only from 40 to 50 rupees the corge which was 100 rupees came down to 40 to 52 rupees per corge but the jamabandi price was the original 56 rupees so where is 56 rupees where is 52 or 40 rupees a difference of 10 to 12 rupees in those years so scholar uh, collectors themselves made references to these kind of anomalies that existed in the revenue system during the colonial time so about uh, revenue payment in cash i have already told you about uh, mortgaging land mortgage or crop mortgage and how the peasants came under the octopus like a grip of the money lenders it's a very pathetic situation that existed so always in economics they say indian farmer always is born in debt he lives in debt and it dies in debt and bequeaths debt so it happened like that during this time as a result uh, we see reactions reactions from the side of the rights or peasants so 1810 11 1830 31 even during the rebellion of kalyana swami in 1837 large number of peasants participated because they were suffering because of the colonial revenue system and revenue assessment so on the whole during this period we can see over assessment we can see a normally in assessment we can see suffering of the uh, riots we can see land mortgaging we can see transfer of land from the poor to the rich impoverishment of land rural indebtedness all these are general consequences of this kind of revenue administration which always aimed at collecting the maximum from the region so though they made half hearted attempts every now and then to bring down the assessment it did not really help the peasants or rights of the region and uh, their uh, burden and their sufferings always existed we could also see another interesting thing that was taking place when the revenue authorities approached the rights for collecting the share of the state many of the rights they could not pay the revenue to the state naturally they were under stress then we have even references to revenue officials like shan boogs shan boogs going along with these revenue clerks and uh, money lenders accompanying shan box money lenders so that when the peasant pleaded with the shan box that he could not pay the revenue the money lender would tell him that uh, i would give you the loan and then you pay the share of the landlord or a share of the state means the money lender and revenue officials were together on many occasions even this reference we could see in the Re- records that money lenders were waiting for opportunity to have business by coaxing 
these arrays who fill a fell in arrears to the government so that at least for that time being they could uh, overcome the problem but maybe instead of uh, foregoing the land to the state they would forego the land to the money lender money lender would be an indian money lender state is a foreign state but of course their cultivator also would be a local only because they cannot bring british people to cultivate here it will be instead of a cultivator it will be b cultivator what i thought of presenting uh, i have completed i have tried to tell some aspects of the revenue administration maybe it will give you a kind of glimpse into the colonial system of working in this region and uh, perhaps we can say that uh, it did not uh, differ much from what was happening in the other parts of india and uh, certain important uh, institutions like uh, the muli varg system private property system bijavari system etc that existed here small proprietors they all uh, you know they had to continue they had no other uh, a uh, way to change them but then uh, certain important changes like uh, for example maximization of revenue this was not a concept uh, during the pre british period that time also our rulers also collected and uh, taxation was not less earlier also compared to the british period it could be less but the uh, people suffered uh, during the period of our rulers also where it was uh, hyder period or tipu period or keladi period or vijayanagara period whatever we speak uh, peasants uh, suffered throughout history only the extent to which they suffered that changed and uh, during the colonial period perhaps it was the maximum definitely it was a change and also collection of revenue only in cash was a big change earlier it was both cash and kind that helped the peasants when it was only in cash and uh, depending upon the market fluctuations in prices etc the peasants uh, had to experience and they had to you know suffer uh, during the colonial times same way when it comes to judiciary and police also just i'll make a reference they made uh, certain important changes in uh, bengal cornwallis uh, stood for the separation of judiciary and executive judiciary and executive should not be in the same hand cornwallis argued but that principle was not followed in south canara in south canara the police duties and magisterial duties were with the collector the collector was not only the revenue authority he was also magisterial authority so magisterial and police functions were in the hands of the collector in the south canara district or in the uh, province of canara and sunda and he always used to sign as collector and magistrate so always below the signature of the collector we will see collector and magistrate munro argued that magisterial and police functions would be best administered by the collector because collector was the one who was going to the villages and he knew the people from close quarters munro argued to maintain law and order to give justice to the people we should know the people and only the collector who visits each and every village so he should be the one who should look after magistrate and police duties argued munro and this went against the very basis of the cornwallis system in which he said judicial and executive functions should not be in one and the same authority this is a very important change so there the zamindari system here the rajatwari system there separation of judiciary and executive we don't see that here so depending upon the local conditions the british also introduced certain changes adjusting themselves with the local conditions 
this also we have to bear in mind and munro on the whole was a liberal administrator and uh, with regard to police duties also he said the traditional village watch system is the best to administer police functions so he wanted the village watch system to continue during the colonial period that is why we see some important uh, changes and also some important areas where they considered the native systems so thank you very much for your patient hearing <laughs>